Hello and welcome back to Makers on Tap, the podcast where makerspace directors drink and talk about making stuff and maker culture. I am your host, Aaron, and joining me are Joe and Christian. We have a very fun and exciting episode planned for today. In the spirit of Murph Month, we have Murph Month. Yes, we have a <laughs> jam-packed episode filled with 3D printing topics. Yay! Woo! Yes, I'm I'm looking forward to it. Uh to start off, what are you guys drinking tonight? Uh so due to me being up in Chicago once again for uh work reasons and pulling overnighters and extremely tiredness uh i stopped at my favorite marketplace uh and i was able to get myself a sapporo uh and so i'm drinking some sapporo tonight and i'm really what excited is that so sapporo is a japanese beer it's um the equivalent of think of like bud light in japan um but it's actually good um and so i like sapporo it's not for everybody but it's it's pretty good to me. <laughs> uh, so Japanese horse piss, got it. <laughs> it's it's better than horse piss. I, yeah, I I am better. I like Kieran better. Yeah, He'll itch Kieran's bomb. pretty good. But you know, uh, and I am back on the Alaskan Smash Galaxy Double IPA. The second time around, it's still not awesome. But I have four more, so um, you know, I drank all the beer that I liked, and I was like, "Ah, oh, man!" I guess now I, you got to go through the other stuff. I guess I have this. So I'm really starting to come around to IPAs now. I've, I've had oh. some the past month. I've been drinking more of them, and I'm starting to. I'm you got to like them more. You got to ruin your palate. That's the thing. Fair enough. Fair enough. So you're really excited for the for the dank meme coming up then? I am I am very excited. Nice. Totes my goats. So what Totes. what are you drinking then? Uh tonight I am drinking the Steel Brewery, the Weisenheimer, which is a Hefweizen ale. Ooh. It is a bit fruity, some a bit haziness. Um, but it's definitely a Hefweizen. Just Tastes like bananas. Banana -y, yeah, banana -y flavor. Nice. Um, I had I had their orange IPA, mm. or yeah, last week, and that's now gone. They have a very awesome experimental like mango IPA on draft, but they didn't have it in the cans, so I couldn't take it home. Hmm. And they wouldn't let me put it in the crowler either. Huh. So yeah, it's, it sucked. But I think the mango IPA I had a couple weeks ago was from them. Hmm. Anyway. Yeah. No. On to maker news. So, Daniel uh, Nore posted some open open RC uh, updates for this year. Uh, yeah. Over that joke, I think you are more up to date on that. Yeah. Um. So every year, uh, Daniel goes through and he updates the open RC F1 car to the current F1 racing standards. Uh, so for the last three years, they've had some cosmetic changes. And uh, this year, the big changes are uh, the front and rear wings are uh, more swoopy and aerodynamic. And um, 3D printing wise, they have been updated to be more printable. So if you don't know what the OpenRC project is, it's a uh, 3D printable open source RC car. Um, he's got... The F1, which is an F1 race car, and a touring car, and a truggy, and a quadcopter, and a whole bunch of stuff. And uh, Daniel's just uh, crazy at really, really nice models that are very printable. And um, there'll be an open RC F1 race at Murph in a couple of weeks. So we'll see lots of these cars being printed, and hopefully we'll have a car too. So Nice. We'll at least awesome. have a pile of parts. <laughs> and that's yep. always the goal yeah in other 3d printing news color fab um, known for making very awesome unique innovative type filaments making doing a lot of multi-material type stuff they have teased a new lightweight pla filament which they say has active foaming technology with up to 65 percent weight reduction and a 35 percent material flow what do you think about hmm. that, Joe? I'm excited for it. Um, PLA is very heavy and dense, 
So when you make like their uh, their teaser is an airplane side cross section, airplane wing, uh, it's like so a when, honeycomb infill. Yeah. So like if you make airplane wings with it, it's it's a very heavy material to print. So having that huge weight reduction is going to be awesome. Uh, I'm curious on how it will affect the rigidity and the strength um, because one of PLA's shining characteristics is this incredibly rigid. Um, so if it retains its rigidity and has that weight reduction, I'd take a significant uh, ductility reduction for parts like that. I think that's going to be really awesome. What do you think, Chris? No, I, man, I, in all honesty, Joe just said a lot of it, of what I was saying, the same stuff. Um, it's really cool. Um, I'm really excited for something like this to come out and just give some better options because I feel like a lot of this stuff at this point has kind of grown stale. There's been a few improvements in the market, um, but this will be the first big refresh in the market to be able to like give us something new to play with. So I'm, I'm pretty excited for it. Yeah. This I year, agree. This year has been fun for material science in the yeah. uh, fused filament world. So I'm excited to see more of that happen. So with the 65% weight reduction, do you think we will be getting a one kilogram spool that will then stretch out 60% more? Or do you think we'll be getting like a forty percent? So would that be like a like a four hundred a four hundred gram spool that then extrudes out to a kilogram? So for a long time in the three D printing world, um, it's it's been discussed that selling by weight is a ripoff because plastic densities vary so much, and especially when you get into like metal fills and stuff. Um, so oh yeah, uh, it, it color fab has been you know, huge in, in all of the different metal fills and carbon fiber fills and, and doing weird things with material science. So it, it's it's pretty typical that when you see a material like this, it's usually sold in five to 700 gram spools. Um, and, you know, it's priced higher uh, than a commodity spool anyway. So I don't know. Um, I, I think if you're buying a 65% weight reduction material, you're buying it for a reason. So Right, you're not going to be complaining that you're not getting a full kilogram. You're you're trying to solve a purpose and not make a giant benchy. So <laughs> that's a good point. You don't know my life. <laughs> what if I want my giant benchy? Um, I want my giant benchy to be sixty percent lighter. <laughs> my super volcano is currently functional, and I would be willing to help you with that. <laughs> I'm about it. Like the biggest freaking benchy on the planet. <laughs> it it's coming to Murph. Nice. I will say this next article in slightly less 3D printery news, but very exciting. Still very cool. Uh Krita? It is a uh I forget what it is. It's a digital painting application. So yeah. mm -hmm. Uh, not like Illustrator where you're doing vector graphics, but like painting and watercolors and sketching. What would the closed source alternative be for that? For those to get a comparison? Inkscape? No, Inkscape no. is an open source no. Illustrator. Uh, what's the other one? Um, GIMP? That's also open source. That's also open source. What's the, what's I the, thought you were saying. What's the closed source. What's the closed oh, source competitor closed source. for credit? Oh. Uh, Photoshop, like, uh, Photoshop or Illustrator. If you're like Photoshop, you can do a lot of, um, painting like this in there. Um, and a lot of stuff like this. So the announcement is that, is that cried a 4.2.0 blaze it edition, <laughs> uh, is the first and only painting application that supports HDR hardware. Um, it's only on windows currently because only windows supports HDR hardware. But Linux has it in the works, so it should so support for Linux HDR should be coming down the road, and Krita will be the only one that can do it. Why do we care though? We care, Joe, because this is like one of the very few times where open source is ahead of the curve of closed source applications. So there are no closed source software solutions that are taking advantage of HDR hardware. 
normally it's the other way around. But I saw this and it's like open source is leading the pack. Very excited. Okay. For the color gamut. Oh. Yeah. So the other reason, the reason we really care about HDR, not not just the open source part. Aaron only cares about the open source part, but functionality wise. um, It's using the HDR color palette. Yeah. Which. No, that makes sense. Which gives us thousands of more colors for better blending and more realistic colors. Um, and yeah, so it's it's super cool. And Crit is a really beautifully written and beautiful to use piece of software. So, well, yeah, and that's like I know I know that um, some of the closed source it, like Premiere does does output for HDR um and it does do that stuff but i don't think photoshop does at this point i don't think they have the color palette available for that yet i know it's supposed to be coming this year is what they've said in their updates but um but, no that's freaking cool that it came out before but Krita like, beat them too. photoshop and yeah. all of those like that's impressive it's exciting but yeah no that's freaking cool i didn't even see that yeah <laughs> awesome <laughs> chris didn't read the articles shocker i <laughs> oh no new shocker what <laughs> chris and read things come on <laughs> hey i was looking at the models i was looking at the future of we, what we're we, discussing we posted this like a week ago <laughs> i you're busy it's fine I, it's fine. i killed myself this it's week fine. it like <laughs> yeah chris has been busy this week he, he has gets, he gets yeah. a bit of a pass he still gets crap yeah. though everyone likes oh, it while we I'm, give him crap i said he i've gets been a bit told of a pass a bit of a pass. <laughs> a slight pass. You know, just that just that little skirt. <laughs> so what's our real topic this week, Aaron? Hold on, dude. We get one more. Mm. One more news topic. One more. It's a bit it's 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 nice. Oh yeah. It's very wholesome. Wholesome wholesome yes. news presented by Makers on Tap. <laughs> yes. It is Do we hold hands? The epi- it is we should. It's the it's the epitome <laughs> of community. So with Google Truly. Plus, Google Plus is dying next month, and all of we and it was just a home for all of these open source communities to you know discuss and organize on their projects, and those people had nowhere to go. Those groups had nowhere to go, and I I just want to give a shout out to this guy named uh, Michael Johnson. Um, I was actually personally looking into building some sort of dedicated. Um, forum for people who design and build 3D printers, and I went to go check the, all these Google Plus groups who are going to be dying, you know, in the next month. And here I see this guy Michael Johnson in like every group, in like every maker group. He's in all the 3D printing groups and all the laser cutter groups, CNC groups. He's saying, "Hey, I'm making this new forum. Um, do you guys want to migrate over to that? If you do, I will. I will migrate all of your." all of your comments, all of your discussions over to that forum just programmatically. So he wrote a tool that he used to migrate all these comments and all these discussions over to a, a discourse forum that he started up called the Maker Forums. And underneath the Maker Forums, you have all these sub forums for all of these old G plus groups. And it preserves all of the usernames and the timestamps and all the comments and the links and everything. So it's like they all happened in this other forum. And if those people were to recreate their account on the Maker forums, all of their past comments get tied to the new account. But he just went through all this effort to preserve all of the knowledge and all the experience and discussions that have, you know, been generated on these on these Google Plus groups. And that is like exactly what the open source community is all about is somebody something happening to the community somebody steps up and fills the gap yeah and it all just works out somehow yeah i i hope this guy's at murph because i want to give him a hug (laughs) he needs all the hugs he needs all the hugs now this this is awesome i i always find it funny um one of the first times when i came to our maker space uh i was talking with joe and we were I I was trying to find good information for um, just researching 3D printing and doing stuff like that. And he's like, yeah, just just hop on G+. And I was like, who the heck uses G+, like 
that's like dead. And granted, this was like four years ago, four and a half years ago, somewhere in there. And he literally just turns to me and goes, only smart people use G+. <laughs> and boy, was he true. Like, everybody on there has been incredibly helpful. Everybody on there has, like, built the coolest community. And I can't wait to see this just continue to grow. Um, like, this is just some of the coolest stuff. So it's it's awesome. I am only sad that I didn't think of it first. Yeah. <laughs> fair enough. Fair That's enough. That's all it is. <laughs> Yeah, I'm pretty thrilled. So that concludes all of our news topics for the night. And on to the main topic, which is how do you model things? How Why do you... you model them? What software do you use to model them? I would say what is the best method of modeling for your object? Yes. Modeling methods <laughs> and their applications. Yeah, there you go. So the right tool for the job. Part two. Part part two. <laughs> part part thirty six point five <laughs> appendix B. Let's get to it, guys. <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of funny. We're all three of us are differently versed in different versions of modeling, um, and that's kind of an interesting thing that has just naturally happened. Um, yeah, but yeah, yeah, yes. So the, this topic came about because, uh, over the last few weeks, I've been trying to figure out the right way to model our cup sleeves that we released last week. And, um, I am very strong in 3d CAD. So like parametric modeling and something like fusion 360 or Creo or SolidWorks. Um, I can do just about anything in it. And, uh, wrapping text around a cylinder in any of those <laughs> softwares is really damn hard. So um, I spent longer than I'm willing to admit trying to find the right method to go about wrapping that text around the cylinders in a way that would be easy for other people to modify too. Um, so I tried Blender. I tried OpenSCAD. I tried Fusion. I tried... What else did I try? I think those were the main ones that I tried, and I ended up doing it in Fusion. Um, I found a way that's convoluted and crazy, but it works really well. Um, but I learned a lot along the way, and it got some good discussion going. So, I'm surprised at how convoluted it was in Fusion. Because <laughs> usually Fusion makes things easy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Aaron was all calling me an idiot because it took me so long to figure out. And then I explained the process to him, and he goes, "Oh, yeah, okay." I wasn't, I wasn't that yeah, rude because <laughs> I remember you were modeling at the space, not like it might have been either this last Thursday or whatever. And I think I just said, or like, um, "Oh, well, can't you just projection model onto the object?" Because that's something totally normal in mesh modeling is you just projection onto it and it wraps around it. Yeah. And right, that's so I was like, <laughs> oh, well, can't you just do that? And he's like, no, like you, that's just not an option. And I'm like, oh, OK, like, yeah, I guess that would be difficult. then. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It turns out it's real hard. So, <laughs> um, yeah, it, it, it generated some fun discussion between us. So what we're going to do tonight is I picked out some models and uh, we're going to look at them. And uh, we're going to discuss how we would go about it, whether it would be easy to do, um, hard to do, or just a, a big old fat no in your specific modeling method. So um, to start, we'll, we'll start with a baseline, and that is a cube. Chris, go. Uh, cube, in my opinion... Um, there's no need for mesh modeling in a cube, so I would just do parametric and just like do a cube. <laughs> okay. It, like, it, in what though? Oh, in what? Like, if you're just trying to throw a cube together and you really like freaking throw it together in like either fusion or, um, there's no really even use. You could do it in SCAD or, um, what's the web app that everybody uses? Oh, Tinkercad. Tinkercad. Um, Tinkercad, yeah. You could just throw Tinkercad, and it would be fine. 
Aaron, yeah, you could you could script. I was gonna. I was about to. I was about to shut on your parade. You could. <laughs> So open open SCAD has the cube is one of the basic, you know, basic models, like with the primitive shapes. Yes. It's like one line. Yeah. One line and you get a cube of any size and <laughs> any size and dimension. And you have but, to but you have to type that line, right? You would type like a line. line that says cube, blah 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 so, blah 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 blah, right? I'm gonna say this for just about every model. <laughs> yes, it's you have to type it out. But because it's code, yes, you can source control it and get. So and you're not wrong, <laughs> and you are not going to see that in any other software. So, um, so before we dive too much farther into this, I don't want to make this about um, one software versus another software versus another software versus another right. software because, like, there's so many different ways we could go down this, and this could turn into a very convoluted, confusing show. So, yes. mm. um. We'll look at this as, uh, like, Chris, like, can you do this in mesh modeling? And, you know, what, oh, what okay. are what are some of the aspects of this model that would make it easier to do in mesh modeling or very difficult to do in mesh modeling? Um, sure. Yeah. And yeah, uh, I really don't want this to be a versus yes. episode because okay. it'd, it'd get hairy. Yes. And <laughs> I think we all hairy. I think we would all agree that we all would just do everything in fusion. Because it just it's just nice. Not everything, and and that's the point nice. of this. Yeah, um, yeah. Because I, I I I tried to start the the cup sleeve infusion, and then found how difficult it was, and then instantly was like, all right, what are the other ways I could go about this? And you know, I leaned on my other CAD software knowledge that I I I had, and uh, you know, we'll, we'll the cup sleeve will will end up being a model. So okay, yeah. Mm. All right, so. Scripting, you would just write a line, and it's a very easy thing to make a cube, right? And then you'd throw it in source control, so that if anybody changed your cube, you would know who did it, and you could revert it. <laughs> yeah. And you could do Fair other... Enough. Yes. All right. Source control. In, in parametric, um, it's it's very easy. You could... There's five different ways I could go about this in a parametric thing. I can either click the cube button for a primitive... Or I could draw a sketch and extrude it and uh, make a cube. How would you yeah. share that model, Joe? How would I share it? Yeah. Um. Well, there are multiple uh, 3D sharing formats. There's something called a step file, uh, which still preserves its editability a little bit. There's an IGES file, which sort of is editable it's it's a mesh file um so circles are no longer circles they're uh you know polygons yeah there is a, a an awesome way if you want to share it outside the software so if you're sharing it in the software that you create you share a source file it's fine it's not a big deal how do you source control that <laughs> um do you really want to dive into this uh kinda. so kind of do in, in professional CAD softwares, they have, um, man, the name is escaping me right now, PLM, Product Life Management. So it's a software that does source control for you. Uh, Team Center is one, Windchill is another, um, Autodesk has one, um, and it tells you who modified the, mo the file last. It allows you to check the file out so other people can't edit it while you have it, uh, so you're not editing on top of each other. It's a binary file, man. You can't That's do that so old crap. School. You can't get checking out. You can't get check a, a binary file. We are getting off topic, drunk Aaron. Um. So this perspective <laughs> is all from the hobbyist maker thing. Yes. Which we all like to share the things we do. Right. I like to gravitate towards the things that are the best to share with. Uh. So other ways you could do it. They're all software dependent. And we just said we're not going to dive into software. So, yeah. If you guys want to di want us to dive into software, I will argue with Aaron for three hours about CAD software. So, <laughs> much just you know, <laughs> agree to say that you can't easily source control it. No, you, you can't. Can you share. totally can't. You're totally right. 100%. Um, <laughs> in, in some of the newer cloud enabled softwares like Fusion or, um, uh, man, the other one. Um, on shape on shape you can totally source control it 
through the cloud files. Um, yeah, I know. But anyway, I just threw up a little in my mouth. <laughs> so if you guys scroll down a little bit, there's a really, really uh, there's a fun file called Spirograph that I linked to. Um, yes. Yep. <sighs> Chris. Um, that is a fun one, model. Yeah, this one would be interesting. Um, so there's a couple different ways you could do it um, with it. So it, my my experience is going to come from when I was modeling in uh, Maya um, and basically doing all of my mesh modeling in that. Um, so there's a couple different ways you could do it. Um, there actually is a programmable way. Um, to make a gear within Maya. Um, and you can have that gear sit in a slot um, and basically cut away the parts in there and be able to make that. So it wouldn't be extremely difficult. Um, it would take a little bit of tweaking and I can definitely see some other softwares being a little bit easier to do this, but it's completely possible. Um, little overkill for it but um very possible so you use like a boolean subtract method to yeah. to do that okay yeah for for people who don't know uh boolean operations are um things like where you take one model and it intersects with another model and you can either uh subtract one model from another one and it'll leave a cavity where that that model that you subtracted used to exist, or you can combine them into two shapes. So like giving a bunny ear bat wing or bunnies bat wings in something like mesh mixer, that's a Boolean operation, or you can make them intersect where the only part that's left is where the two parts uh, came together. And it removes everything that um, was outside of that intersection point. Uh, so that's what we're saying when we say bo Boolean. Um, yep. <laughs> so this spirograph model, how would you explain it to someone who hasn't doesn't have it pulled up? Um, it is a set of gears. Uh, there's a ring gear, so it's a big round gear that another gear can track inside. And there's little holes inside the gears that go on the inside, so you can put a pen in it and draw cool shapes. And those holes are in like a Fibonacci disc spiral, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And some of them, and some of them, they're in cubes or just kind of random. So, how would you model this, Joe? Um, I would probably use uh, a gear generation script uh, in my software to make the actual gear uh, bodies and then draw a sketch on the shape of the gear to do my uh, my pen holes to uh yeah for my, my little drawing holes um this is something in parametric that uh would go very well this this is the kind of stuff that parametric modeling is made for uh, mm -hmm. is open scad parametric mm. i don't know what it's technically called open scad is scripting script yeah scripted it's fully modeling. script based uh, but it is parametric in the sense that you use parameters to drive your models. Very much so. Yeah, so, like, looking at this, I know for a fact there is a, there is community-made gear generator libraries for it, because I've used them already. Um, so that would, I would use that to make the gear. And as far as the Fibonacci holes, you can write for loops in OpenSCAD. And the spiral would be a great use case for a for loop that exponentially increases where you translate the hole to. So as you rotate 360 degrees, you would exponentially increase how much you translate it. Yeah. And that would get you your Fibonacci spiral. Hmm. I'm on a huge open SCAD kick. Um, I never model in it, but as a developer, it has a special place in my heart. Secret and I enough. really want to get better at it. So I can just default to that, but right now I just default to Fusion because I'm a piece of shit. <laughs> Secretly, I don't know how to do mesh modeling or scripted modeling like 
hardly at all. So I really, this, this whole show is really just me finding more out about your modeling methods. Um, all right. So the next one I wanted to dive into is uh, the fluid vase by Joseph Prusa. Mm -hmm. Um, I just wouldn't even bother. <laughs> I, it's a Perusa. I wouldn't bother. <laughs> uh. Um, no, this is, it's a really cool vase. Um, or do you want to go? I was going to say, it looks like it's designed by somebody else, but it says it's a vase by Joseph Prusa. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. That's not the point. The, the title is Fluid Vase by Joseph Prusa. Chris, how I'm... would you go about modeling this? <laughs> so, <laughs> there's there's a couple different ways you can do this, and that, I guess that's going to be how I start off every way talking about this. Um, Always. The... The main way you could definitely do it would be um, cylinder extrude, and then you could basically populate the whole model, and then you could go in and make this. So it wouldn't look exactly like this. It would be very individualistic. You could definitely do it. It would just take time. The vase that we're talking about is very it's it's very artistic. Um, it has a lot of just like fluid design through it um and it's got a lot of just in and out parts it's kind of extruded subtracted all that kind of stuff and it looks really cool um but it's very very wavy um the description says it is supposed to mimic the water currents bouncing around boulders in a small stream oh that's you know that's a good way of putting it <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome um what it really reminds me yeah. of is like uh fabric flowing in uh turbulent water mm -hmm. that's what it really reminds no me it's of. it's very it's it's not symmetrical at all in mm -hmm. and in any way um and so you definitely could do it it would just take time um however with that you get to make something exactly the way you want because you would be able to um subtract and extrude in the exact way that you would want to do it. So it's, it, it's entirely, it, it's entirely possible. It would just take time. Um, but with that, you get to make a very cool product. Aaron. Like I said, I wouldn't even bother. <laughs> it's because Aaron hates stuff. art. <laughs> I don't hate art. I just can't do it. I'm just, that's just not how my brain works. I only ever <laughs> model or print things when I need something. So it's purely a functional thing for me. Yeah. I Fair totally enough. I totally love this model and I love people who make these things. So, you know, props to that. I just I would even know how to approach this. And I would never in a million years come up with this. Ever. So uh um my my CAD brain, when I look at models like this, it just breaks. It, it absolutely yeah. breaks. So I, uh, for me, the answer is just no, no. <laughs> <laughs> so I did just remember there is a method that you can do that. Um, there is a randomize mm. um, option in your polygons. And so you can give it a value and it can like, it creates these funky waves on it. And you can either tell it waves or you can tell it spikes. Um, you can tell it rocky formations, but it's meant to emulate um, terrain uh exposure and so you give it that method and it automatically creates your surface and like so mm. if you want to really quickly emulate like a rocky terrain you just throw that on there give it the terrain value and then hit randomize and it creates like a random um random rocky terrain and so you could do that i totally forgot about that but that that actually is probably how that was created was they gave it a water pattern and then um, had to emulate the waves at the crest to point out and at the bottom to point in. And so, and then they just hit random on it and that's how it did it. Ah. So, so you're yeah. saying this is program based? Somewhat. It would be somewhat program based. Um, but yeah, it, I totally forgot about that method. It's totally a thing. Um, it wasn't until you, Joe started talking that I was like, oh, wait, yeah, I totally remember this. <laughs> I, I do have to admit, um, yes, I did do mesh modeling and I, I did it for a while, but I did it back in college, which was a little bit ago. <laughs> um, and I haven't done it 
super to the extent of what I was doing when I was in college. And so some of my stuff is a little rusty. Um, and it's like on Maya, on an older version of Maya. And I'm sure there's a way easier way of doing that now. Yeah. But um, that's what I do remember. The methodology is the same. I've been modeling for 15 yeah. years. And the way I started to model is the same way I started the model 15 years ago. Like, yeah, the methodology is the same. We still put our pants on two legs at a time, right? Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> As a fellow human. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, um, all right. So in the uh, same spirit of vases, the quad trihelix by John, just Ooh. down just a little bit. This this vase is so cool. It starts out as a uh, triangle at the base, and then it extrudes out into four triangle sections that rotate around each other, and then it meets itself again. And uh, I found a really good, um, like, progressive build video as, as somebody was printing it on Instagram that we'll link to. Uh, it's just an absolutely beautiful model, though. Yeah. And go, Chris. Uh, this one actually would be extremely easy. Um, there is there is specifically a function to do stuff like this. And it's mainly um, the easiest way that I could describe it is it was originally created to emulate double helix. Um, and so you use that functionality to um, do that kind of stuff. So you could basically tell it, start from this shape, extrude out to this, and then join back up here. Um, and you just model that out. And it's it's just on a guide, and it's super easy to do. Um, you could have a model done like this in maybe like an hour and a half. It, it'd be easy. Nice. Aaron? I don't do artsy stuff. <laughs> We've been over this. <laughs> it's I, a very pretty model. Uh, it's... I couldn't. I could never do it. So I'm going to speak for you because but I'm. I'm going to say one thing, Chris. Okay. How do you source control that? How... <laughs> Nobody cares, Aaron. Nobody cares. It's very. It's very important. What if somebody comes along and makes a change to your vase model? <laughs> <laughs> The whole and universe. Like, Who made this change to my vase model? And nobody knows, and you can't revert the change because it's been done already. The whole... you source control, you'd be like, Joe made a change to my vase model. I'm going to revert that. And you revert it. Anyway. Source control. Okay. Mo <laughs> models like this are, they're almost made to be programmed. Um, mm -hmm. So they, this, this model is really beautiful. Um, in a CAD software, um, this is called a uh, a swept loft. So there's there's lofts and there's sweeps, and uh, you kind of combine the two to create something like this. And it, it's very much what you said, Chris, where you start out with a shape and uh, you give it progressive shapes that you want it to join to as it grows, and um, and you can tell it to twist or whatever. And um, it's it's a little more difficult in a CAD software. Uh, typically, uh, sweeps and blends and lofts really hate everyone that tries to use them. Uh, but they are very <laughs> useful for doing cool things like this. Yeah. All right. The next one uh, is the Halo Helmet by Big Red Frog. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, it's me. Um, sorry, I just got lost in thought because Master Chief Collection just got put on Steam. <laughs> <laughs> which, um, which means you can play it on Linux, guys. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All of a sudden, the, the theme song was going through my head as I was looking at this helmet. <laughs> no, so um, this was actually a lot of the stuff I used to do when I was in uh, my... I was doing animation and um, character modeling. Um, I did sp like do a little bit in terrain modeling and stuff like that, but most of the stuff I was doing was character and um, object based, so like spaceships, characters, stuff like that. Um, and so something like this, it's it, it's almost more accustomed to do it in a uh, mesh modeling kind of way because you can really create details that 
would just take a lot of time um, with other stuff. Uh, you, it, it's, it's very lean towards that um, in a polygon based way. And so, uh, it, it is the Mark five halo helmet. Um, and so it's got a lot of details. It's got a lot of things on the sides of it, extrusions, um, characteristics on it that lean it more towards that. So, but it's, it's an awesome model. Um, and I, yeah, you, you could, you could absolutely do this and you could have a lot of fun with it. Um, I saw somebody do the, uh, Hibusa helmet not too long ago, and I really actually want to oh. print that here soon. Yeah, I love the Hibusa helmet. That was my favorite one to get. That's um, a name I haven't heard in a while. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, uh, what makes mesh modeling uh, more le leaned towards things like this? So, the reason I would say is because you can really you can really get in there and change the individual characteristics of each thing. So it's like if you you're creating these different layers of the object and you can like fold and mold them to exactly what you want it to be. Um, you don't have to like add a new object on there. You can just pull out or extrude in on those things and you can really give depth and value into something. So most of the time, um, when you start with mesh modeling, you start with either a circle or a square, and then that becomes your base object for whatever you're going into. Um, and something like this was most likely started with a circle and you just bring out certain characteristics in each thing. Um, they have a symmetrical function, uh, in Maya, which is really nice, which is probably what you would do in this circumstance, um, where you can just start to really create those details in that circle and pull them out and all that kind of stuff. And it, it's just more conducive to real, like real in-depth objects, things that have characteristics that are living, that are breathing, that stuff like that. So is um, it, is it like sculpting or like, we're, yeah. or like, that's what I was going to say. Is it more like molding clay versus, you know, cutting out shapes that piece together? Yeah, so it, mesh modeling is a lot like sculpting. You're you're cutting away, you're adding all that kind of stuff of just like creating this thing over time, um, and that's how you can get such high quality detail with the polygons. Um, whereas in not in verses, but in uh, in the other ways of doing things, you can absolutely do it in other pieces of software. I believe it would just take a lot more time. Yeah. Aaron? Yeah. <laughs> How I, I I I cannot fathom doing this in either Fusion or OpenSCAD. It's one of those things where you do just need to sculpt it. There there is no mathematical equations to this. Oh, so. there are. They're just real hard. I <laughs> <laughs> I could see doing it in a CAD software if I really wanted to. Like in in the real world, like the helmets are sculpted in a CAD software, um, nice. so it's definitely possible. But the time uh, and the love would really need to be put in to make a, a Halo helmet. So whoever has modeled the Halo helmets and guns that are out there on Thingiverse, I thank you because I will be printing yeah. them soon. And um, I just, I'm finally getting to a point in my life where I can print the things I've been wanting to print for a long time and stop printing printers. Uh, and I'm real excited about it. All right. The last thing that I'm going to ask you guys about is the coup de grace. The thing that we really care the most about, and that is... The coup de grace. The coup, the coup, de, gras. coup de gras. Coup de gras. Coup de grapes. Coup de, coup de grapes. Coup de, coup de, the real fancy stuff. That's It's French for real fancy stuff, right? And that is the Makers on Tap cup sleeve for Murph 2019. <laughs> yes. Chris? Yes. How would you um, go about producing this? So if I was if I was still versed good enough, I actually would have helped with this and I had the time. Um, but I've been, like I said, pulling overnighters, 
pretty much every night this week. Chris just admitted that he's selfish. Slow. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, because it it wouldn't have been terrible to do in mesh modeling. Um, like I said at the beginning of the show, there actually is a way for you to project a SVG onto a object within uh, mesh modeling. And then once you do that, it just gives that a value and you can extrude out of it. Um, now, the kind of tick with that is that the values within the mesh modeling, at least in, when I was doing it, um, were not as conducive to real world values. You were just creating this thing in a 3D space. So what you could do is you could import a model of a solo cup and then try and base it off of that to give you the best guess. Mm -hmm. And then um, once you do that, you would have to play with it a little bit in your slicing software to figure out exactly how it would actually print out. So it's entirely possible in mesh modeling, and it's, it is it is not as difficult, um, but it is possible. Um, so, but yeah, that that's what I would probably venture towards. All right. Aaron, I don't know where to start. I... <laughs> Aaron did his homework, everyone. <laughs> I did my homework. It's a, it's, it's all source control. <laughs> Please. <laughs> all you dinguses with your don't know when your files were changed. <laughs> and I'm sitting here with my source control. <laughs> no, exactly. Who and when? Who and when? Yes. Uh, Yes. You have the information that matters. Don't have a model, <laughs> but you know who changed it and when. That's right. Oh, oh man. man. <laughs> so uh, I'll talk briefly about how I, I I tried to do this and then how I ended up doing it. So um, the way that I wanted to do it, and I spent a lot of time trying, was in Blender. And in Blender, you can take a, a, a curved geometry, whether it's text um, for the makers on tap 35 listeners sleeve, for example, and um, give it a, a curve to follow and, and put a curve modifier on it and be like, boop, and, and it wraps around that curve modifier. And then you could do a Boolean operation to remove it from your cup sleeve model if you want um i ran into some issues with that and uh making it printable um i'm just not versed enough in blender to understand how to do some of the things i would normally do in fusion to make sure that the model is relatively printable at the end so i wasn't happy with the results and then um uh, i met a guy on uh, Twitter. Uh, his Twitter handle is at Brendan underscore builds. And uh, he is an absolutely incredible 3D modeler, printer builder guy, and just an all around super nice dude. And he went over his methodology for how to do this in Fusion. And um, it's not easy. It involves using sheet metal uh, in Fusion to do it. And there's a couple tutorials out there on wrapping text around a cylinder. And it turns out wrapping an SVG around a cylinder is the same principle. Um, so if you go out and look at uh, just Google wrap text around a cylinder in Fusion 360, you can get a pretty good idea of how I got the logo around it. Um, we'll be releasing some multi-material models this week that... Uh, use a slightly different methodology uh, that I may or may not go over later. It depends on time. Um, but I would like to share that methodology because like Aaron said, it was not intuitive at all. Uh, but it is super cool. And once you know the order of operations, it's not hard. Uh, so you can make some really neat things with it. So, yeah. So we have seven minutes left. You think you can explain it in seven minutes? Oh. No. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I I could. I could totally explain it. E even the people that are versed in fusion would just be like, what is this dude trying to explain? Um, 
it's just, it's so convoluted and you get you have to go in and out of modules um i'd rather i'd rather just like make a tutorial on how i did the makers on tap sleeve and release that on our youtube channel um, so i was gonna say that would actually be kind of cool if we could have a video of it and then just kind of while we're printing it at murph have the video playing right next to it of how you modeled it yeah yeah that would actually be kind of cool so if you could like screen record and do that that would be kind of fun so uh when we release the sleeves i also released the source so you can hit the play button in the bottom of the fusion bar and see how i did it um with the fusion archive hey that's how i shared the models i released the fusion archive with has all of the history that's all editable aaron I mean, <laughs> that's great and all. <laughs> In technicality, you can't source control that. I don't care. It's a, it's care. a it's a different model that they're downloading. I don't care if they change. I in fact, I want you to change it. I want you to make a really awesome makers on tap sleeve so you can come win a hug or a broken piece of printer hardware that I pulled out of my bin and I haven't found <laughs> yet. You know? It is Please. admirable. <laughs> it is admirable that you shared your source code. Thanks. Sadly, sadly, the software you used does not export us a format that is easily source controllable. Just put it that way. Well, I mean, oh, if man. you if you use the Fusion Cloud, you can share the project, and then you can see who changed it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Aaron. Your stuff is the best. <laughs> You're damn right. <laughs> oh my well, god! <laughs> I did want to give a quick shout out um, to one of the artists that I follow, who does some really cool stuff, and he releases a lot of the stuff for free. Um, uh, Chris Kuhn, the three D printing art or three D artist, uh, he has a page on Facebook that you can follow. He does a lot of really cool stuff, and he also does a lot of stuff for um like contest kind of stuff where he just releases his uh pr or like his models for free and then we'll say hey put this in a scene that you want to see it in because he does a lot of these to make these ready for um like shorts or animated stuff or anything like that he does a lot of that cool kind of stuff so i follow him i've been following him for quite a while he does a lot of really cool stuff that i followed uh, still, even though I'm not modeling as often anymore, but if you really want to see somebody who does some really badass mesh modeling, um, check him out. What does he use, Chris? Um, I'm pretty sure he uses. Uh, he uses Blender. Does he? Yeah, he's a Blender enthusiast. He uses Blender. Yeah. Nice. yeah, he does use Blender. I was, I was, I was gonna say, yeah. Because nice. Blender, I will say, I finally got to use that newest update. I got to at least see it. Um, holy crap. Uh, that Yeah, that literally has everything in it now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's beautiful. So I'm planning on learning Blender here soon. <laughs> Man, a closed source guy is going to learn Blender. <sighs> There's so much. You know, you know, earlier, he couldn't even name a closed source alternative. <laughs> When asked, we're breaking him. We're breaking him down <laughs> S slowly but surely. Slowly but surely. <laughs> oh, but yeah. All right. I think I'm done. I think we're all done. We are at 58 minutes. Sweet. Um, any other any closing statements? Last thoughts. Um, I the one thing I would say is like, if you're good in a software don't feel like you have to learn something else to try to achieve your model. Like just go, go make something awesome. Um, yeah, definitely, definitely use, use the tool you're comfortable with unless you want to challenge. Yes. And then try something, try something new and then try blender. If you want to challenge. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh. <laughs> Thanks guys. Cool. This is the end of the podcast. <laughs> We're never going to get good at the ending. The ending. The ending. The ending. The ending.